This week on The Communicators, three interviews from the 2010 Gov 2.0 Expo. This is an event for companies interested in selling technology and technology services to the federal government. In this program, you'll hear about the needs of the disabled when it comes to the web and how teenagers relate to the Internet. And our first interview is with Jeffrey Carr. He's the founder of Greylogic. That is a firm that works with U.S. and foreign governments on cybersecurity. In this interview, Mr. Carr discusses the security of U.S. computer networks. From the Gov 2.0 Expo in Washington, D.C., here's Jeffrey Carr. For those who may not know, what is Greylogic? Uh, Greylogic is a consulting, private consulting firm that does cyber intelligence work for U.S. government, foreign government agencies, and private corporations. And we specialize in the actors that are behind the malware, state actors, non-state actors that are um, involved in so much of the cyber conflicts and cyber threats and, um, and activities that we see today. As far as the actors are concerned, how does this government do in, in dealing with them, in your opinion? Well, uh, probably as good as anybody else, but it's a very difficult environment because the, inter the Internet platform provides uh, complete anonymity for those who want to engage in cloaking their, um, uh, who they are. So it's, it's an extremely difficult problem. As far as those specifically involved, when we talk about actors, I think a country that comes up often enough is China. But is that the only country? No, no, there's many countries, many countries. And small African countries are involved. And in, uh, it, it depends on who you, uh, it depends on how you define the scope. But cyber, uh, cyber operations by governments range from Zimbabwe and, and, uh, and uh, Burma to uh, you know, China, the Russian Federation, uh, Turkey, Iran, Israel, uh, even uh, Hamas uh, is involved. I mean, it's it's very widespread. Yeah. So uh, uh, the key, I think, is just to understand that you you can't tell, you cannot identify who's attacking you simply by looking at the malware or by looking at the code. You really need a, to to back up and take a much broader view. So if you know that something, if you know specifically what was taken or what's being targeted, that's a clue towards who might need that, if it's a state or a, a non-state actor. And, and if you have a history of tracking these you know, groups, then it helps you narrow the field of who might be responsible. As far as the broader view, can you expand on that when you say you have to take a broader view when approaching these actors? Sure, so the, the internet has um, provided this wonderful leveling, um, it's a leveling uh, and the introduction of a 45 was the great equalizer. And it's the internet has done that now. Uh, so the United States, with all of its vast resources, uh, can be uh, are, is now vulnerable to very small groups and, and with uh, very little money and, and almost complete anonymity. You know, so this is a really a perfect storm of opportunity for bad actors. Um, so the, what we do, I can only speak for you know Great Logic, but. Mm -hmm. We look at uh, the mechanisms that are in place in other countries. So, who are who are the potential adversaries that might be targeting us? And that would be certainly uh, depending on what we're talking about. But in terms of intellectual property and technology, that would be China. You know, the People's Republic of China is very aggressive in terms of technology, um, uh, uh, going after technology secrets. You know, from other countries, from other companies. Uh, there's 11, over 1,100 research labs operated inside of China that are foreign labs. Uh, all of them are vulnerable to this type of, of uh, cyber espionage. Uh, then you have, uh, you know, nation states like the Russian Federation that utilize the Internet to help control populations or political groups in opposition to the Kremlin. So and that includes the Commonwealth of Independent States, you know, as well as uh, countries like Poland and even, uh, you know, spreading further out. So uh, it, it, we, that's what we study, it, you know, is who's going after what, what are they interested in, and, um, and, and the, the thing that still, the thing that makes that hard is when a company or a group has been attacked and they don't report it, you know, so because a lot of companies will not report it. Uh, power, the, the privately owned power grid companies that operate the power grid almost never report an attack, and yet they're constantly being hit. Because they don't want to be seen as compromised. That's well, partly that, but they, they want to avoid the possibility of a lawsuit as well. Um, same with banks. Many banks are undergoing uh, re attacks, and yet they can't or they won't report it for fear of uh, 
whatever. I mean, it's it's a private it's a private company, so it's up to them. But as long as this uh, tendency continues, where uh, you have many victims that are going uh, that are not announcing, uh, it's going to be it's going to favor the bad actors and make the work that the law enforcement is trying to do much harder. So uh, I'm hoping that's one of the things I hope to cover, you know, tomorrow. As far as the law enforcement side, how how would you gauge? how well we're defensed against these type of attacks? Well, I, I view, I think in terms of, you know, what what can the United States do or what, where should we put our resources to fighting cyber threats? In my opinion, it's through law enforcement and through international agreements so that, and this, this, and this is very successful. I mean, we see success after success and uh, hacker group, criminal hacker groups that are being uh, identified and shut down or IS, bad ISPs that are being shut down. And this is all done through the work of various U.S. law enforcement, in, in addition to uh, international law enforcement efforts, uh, I think that's the way to go. So, so, Justice Department, FBI, CIA, which branches? Well, I think law enforcement would be uh, FBI, Secret Service, in terms of federal law enforcement. Um, then they have their colleagues overseas. You know, I think local and state police have to be involved in order to encourage you know the businesses that are being attacked to report it you know uh, I know a lot of a lot of uh, um, small and medium-sized businesses are now being attacked because they're easy victims they're not local law enforcement may not have the resources you know to even uh, uh, do anything about it so uh, so I think that's a better way to go than to um, spend a lot of energy in in trying to organize an international treaty of some type you know regulating the um, you know, treating cyber warfare like it was a uh, nuclear weapon or something, a weapon of mass destruction. I think that's the wrong approach. So. Um, as far as the, the White House is concerned, they have a, a White House coordinator for cybersecurity. Various branches of the D DHS have cybersecurity efforts. How, could you gauge how well they talk to each other about this effort? And does that help, or, does that help uh, what you're trying to do? I think that it's improved a lot uh, over the last few years. Uh, obviously, there's always room for improvement. Uh, I think the biggest problem with the U.S. government in general is that nobody has the authority to actually uh, push something through. So everyone has resp different responsibilities, but no one really has the authority to make it happen. And that's one of the um, disadvantages that a democracy has. In China, it's not an issue. And that's one reason why they're cracking down on their bad ISPs. Whereas in the United States, we're becoming the world's leader in bad ISPs. In other words, by that I mean um, a, a Europe, East European hacker crew will buy server time from a U.S. company and then launch their attacks from the U.S. company to wherever they want in the world. So we're the, becoming the, the favored host, and that's just, that's just wrong. You know? And yet it's very hard in a democracy to, to change that. The years we've heard various case, you know, worst case scenarios as far as cyber attacks here in the United States. As, a, as an outsider who, who runs his own company, looking at these things, what is the worst case scenario in your opinion as far as attacks against the United States? The worst case scenario, as far as I'm concerned, is that there's that focus continues to be on worst case scenarios, because the the uh, uh, what is actually happening today is the and you name the state, and this is the way that they're operating, is that their attacks are under the radar. They they they're constructed. Uh, the strategy is such that we do not want it, uh, to trigger um, an event that's going to harm us from the United States. So we're going to make our attacks subtle. Uh, we're, we'll be patient. You know, uh, we'll, it, it will cost you more to try to harden your security than it will to defend against my attack. You know, and that's the perfect uh, uh, method because as long as that continues, we'll continue to make other things more important. Uh, so therefore I see that as the worst case scenario because in 10 years from now we'll be wondering how in the world did we become a second rate power when uh, it's been a gradual process under the radar for all that time. And that was Jeffrey Carr of Grey Logic. Up next, a discussion on the needs of the disabled when it comes to using the internet. Judy Brewer is an advocate for the disabled for the World Wide Web Consortium, which is an international organization that works to develop standards for the web. What's the World Wide Web Consortium? The World Wide, the World Wide Web Consortium is the standards body for the web. 
We're an international vendor neutral organization. We develop the technologies on which the web runs. So we bring you the web. It's uh, directed by Tim Berners-Lee, the inventor of the web. And we cover many issues of current technology, uh, everything from HTML and graphics and privacy, security, multimedia, and so forth. Including your special. And one of the areas that we work on is accessibility, because it's important that the web be accessible to and usable by everyone, and also internationalized and device independent and so forth. But W3C has been working on web accessibility for, I believe, 13 years now and we're considered the leading organization in the world with regard to a, a knowledgeable authority on web accessibility. And uh, we have developed a number of guidelines for web accessibility. Uh, we've developed, we've ensured accessibility support in all of the technologies that are developed by W3C, all the mainstream technologies there. We do education and outreach and a number of other things to ensure that people with disabilities can use the web. Can you give examples of how the web may limit those with disabilities about? The kinds of barriers that one might encounter, right. yeah. So um, if somebody has a visual disability, you want to make sure that uh, graphics are, are described and video as well, because otherwise people might miss key information that's there. If somebody ha is uh, deaf or hard of hearing, you want to make sure that audio is captioned. If somebody has uh, a problem with movement, for instance, dexterity, they might not be able to use a mouse, they might not be able to use their hands, they might be using speech recognition, you want to make sure that websites work for them as well. Uh, cognitive or intellectual disability, you want to make sure that the navigation for the site is consistent, predictable, and so forth. And you want to make sure that websites work well with assistive technologies, which are some specialized technologies that some people with disabilities rely on, such as voice recognition or uh, in, in, in screen magnification, uh, speech rec uh, sorry, uh, s screen reader uh, compatibility and so forth. These are important also for accessibility. That's a wide front, so as far as the way you see it, who is directly involved to making these uh, technologies more accessible? Is it the makers of the computers? Is it the maker of the website? Yeah. How does that work? Well, you really need all the key players at the table coming up with an agreed upon set of requirements and consensus solutions for that. So you need the uh, industry developers, uh, the content developers, you need uh, people with disabilities, you need government, you need research. And uh, one of the things we've done is to create uh, a single set of guidelines, the web content accessibility guidelines that describe how a website needs to be accessible. Uh, and it covers all of those different user requirements that I talked about. Uh, and then we also have guidelines for authoring tools. So that's the software you use to create websites, to produce that content. And we have guidelines for browsers and media players. So we take all of the requirements and put them into this one set of guidelines. Now, you call them guidelines, but they're not mandatory, right? Well, if you look at the situation in the United States, at the federal level, there are multiple requirements that apply. And so most people working in federal government are probably familiar with uh, US Section 508. And that it, it addresses accessibility of information uh, uh, technology that is procured by a federal government. And that has to be accessible to, uh, usable by people with disabilities, uh, and also by the public that may be accessing information from the federal government. Uh, and then there's also portions of the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA that apply, there are portions of Section 504, which deals with programmatic access to the web. If you look in many areas of, of government, there are requirements that apply. If you look at the FCC's new broadband plan, there are accessibility considerations and their strategic plan for the coming years for broadband. And so uh, if you work in federal government, you need to be thinking about accessibility in all of the work that you do. And that also flows on to state government as well. And is the federal government upholding their end and making these uh, technologies more accessible? Well, uh, it, it does take many different players to make the web accessible. So there's the guidelines, which is essentially the accessibility standard that is developed by W3C. That's been taken up uh, by the U.S. Access Board in, a, uh, in regulations for Section 508. They're updating that now, and one of their key goals is harmonization with W3C. But then there's still the question of what the software developers do. Do they support this in their products? For instance, in, tool, in authoring tools that are used to create content for sites, 
Do they make it easier to make accessible content? We're seeing some progress in that area. We'd like to see a lot more. And then there's the question of, is the content on websites itself accessible? And we're, we'd like to see more progress in that area as well. So it's really uh, you know, multiple stages that need to happen. And the implementation side uh, needs, needs work still. And that's one of the things I'm here at the conference to talk about is how you look at a combination of the technical resources that are available, the standards that can help you get to the goal of making accessible content, and implementation planning process to also achieve that accessibility. If there's, he if there's a hesitancy to implement these kind of things, where is it coming from? Are, are there barriers? Are there You know, hurdles? it's an interesting question. Uh, so awareness is always, unfortunately, one part of that, that question because for some reason, we, we aren't as far ahead as we are in the built environment now. If you see a new building go up and there's steps at the front and no ramp, something looks odd to you about that building, right? So that, that same awareness hasn't completely made it into the digital ar arena yet. But we're, we're making progress on the awareness level. And sometimes it's a question of, you know, people aren't aware of obligations, so, you know, legislation, regulations that they should be following. Uh, you have also a lot of innovation in the technical field, and so sometimes it may be harder for people to find information about the specific techniques, but the thing is that information is there. there there's an enormous amount of resources online for how to make web content accessible, and uh, more training would help, uh, more software that facilitates the production of content would help. Uh, there's still some ways to go. Uh, as far as your role then, uh, as an advocate, I would say, mm -hmm. are you talking to technology companies? Are you talking to software developers about their role and, and what they could be doing and, and what more they They're could working do? with us. You know, they're at the table helping develop these guidelines and standards, helping develop the educational resources, the supporting techniques. Uh, and the, there's a huge amount of volume on the web, so we still haven't gotten to everyone yet. But um, industries at the table, the disability community is, government is, research. Uh, so the right folks are at the table, but still a ways to go. How do you gauge if you've been successful in your efforts? That's actually a very interesting question as well. Um, there, at the federal level, there uh, is evaluation that's supposed to happen uh, every several years from uh, Department of Justice, for instance. And so uh, we're hoping to see more of those reports published in the coming period. Uh, we're also hoping that across all areas of the web, there will be more involvement in evaluation, like some of these large-scale survey evaluations on a sector-by-sector business-wise would be a good partner for some of the work that's happening in government to drive creation of accessible content. And I think having the action going on in public and private sector together might drive more tools development more rapidly as well. And that was Judy Brewer with the World Wide Web Consortium at the site of the Gov 2.0 Expo in Washington, D.C. Now finally on the communicators this week, you'll hear from Dana Boyd of Microsoft Research. As a social scientist, one of her areas of study is how young people use the Internet. For those who aren't familiar with Microsoft Research, it's basically an academic department inside Microsoft. Uh, it's, a re it's a pure research division. Uh, we are looking things that are far, far in the future. Most of my colleagues are computer scientists, thinking about pure algorithms, cryptography, and you know, these sort of challenges. My role is to think about the major social issues that aren't just affecting us right now, but are going to affect us 10, 15 years from now. Uh, and in this way, it, it fits the same sort of model as the old Xerox PARC or AT&T Bell Labs, except very much about the digital age. So, in essence, you think about how society reacts to technology and how they interact with each other? I think about how people, not so much the society at large, but all sorts of people are thinking about technology. My work is primarily with teenagers, actually, and thinking about how they're coming of age, making sense of technology, and what their experiences say to us more you know, largely about the future of technology. You know, effectively, I'm a professor. You could call me a sociologist, uh, except that I'm you know, doing this in a different kind of position. My goal is to not just think about it you know, and write journal articles, but to think about it and try to affect a whole variety of different arguments publicly. Right? And so technology company is one part of it, but also, of course, this affects policy, this affects parents, this affects educators. Um, so a lot of my work is really trying to get out to that public good. 
that teenagers have always interacted with technology. Of course. How is this age different from ages past? Well, in some ways it's not. Teenagers are doing the same things that they've always done. But what technology is available today is very different than the technology that, for example, I grew up with. Right? I grew up very much calling my friends on the phone. Try, you know, When three-way calling came in, it was really exciting. We did all sorts of adventurous things with it. Today's teens are coming of age using the, tech, the internet technologies just as part and parcel of growing up. And so they're sitting there being like, how can I hang out and joke around with my friends? How can I share information? What does gossip look like now? What does flirting look like now? And technology plays a role in all of that. It plays a role in the whole coming of age process. And what's interesting is, is that teenagers are using the same technologies as a lot of adults, but often for different reasons. And, the re and it really comes down to the fact that they're at a different life stage. Um, and while you know, adults are socializing, uh, teenagers are trying to actually make sense of simply who are their friends. Right? That's not something that you have worked out necessarily when you're 14, and you're struggling with that. So of course the technology plays a role in that. So their use of the social network sites you know, really reflects all of the challenges that they are facing as teens. So they're making sense of who they're friends, but they're doing this through a machine, essentially. Well, but they're not. They're doing it through a whole set of different interactions. The machine is just one component of it. They see their friends in school, then they go home, and they're, you know, sending photos back and forth through Facebook, then they're you know, popping over to IM or you know, dropping a, uh, a text message to one another, calling each other up for long dialogues. What we're seeing is constant media switching. Um, it's not just one place. It's not just the internet. And most teenagers, when you ask them, they'd much get, rather get together in person. But there's a whole long list of reasons why they can't. Their parents won't let them. Their parents think it's too dangerous out there. They're supposed to be doing their homework. Their friends don't have any free time. Their friends live too far away. They'll go on and on about how they'd much rather get together in person, mind you, without parents sitting there and watching in on them. They'd love unstructured time to goof around. But most of the United States, we don't have that culture of get on your bike and be home by dark. It's really disappeared. And a lot of it has to do with the culture of fear. Um, and so teenagers realizing that they don't have these opportunities are finding any other outlet. And that's where we see the social media really proliferating is the places where they can't get together in person. Uh, you say social media, is it typical Facebook, is it typical Twitter, or are there other avenues that teenagers use that possibly adults don't? Well, it's actually even less Twitter. Twitter is much more adult dynamic. Uh, you know, most of it is like text messaging is huge. Um, text messaging for social chat. You know, anybody who's a parent has seen the phone bills that have come in with text messaging, right? So parents will text message as well, but not to the degree that young people will. There's certain news sites that have popped up that teenagers are using more than adults. An example would be Formspring. Um, where that's which is a question and answer service that's completely plugged into Facebook, which is why they're you know how they're using it. Teenagers were some of the first on chat roulette, much to the horror of their parents. Um, so teenagers are using different media, and they're always looking for new and interesting things. But usually the sites that uh, attract adults first don't get to teenagers. It's usually the sites that start with you know young college kids or tw early twenty somethings that get to, to teenagers. So for example, Facebook and Twitter are two very different beasts. Twitter is fundamentally about uh, power unequals. It's about following specific people. And so the, the teenagers who are on it are there because they want to follow Justin Bieber, or they want to follow Shaquille O'Neal, or they want to follow a specific celebrity, um, whereas adults are doing all sorts of attempts to build their own cred and their own visibility. Teenagers are much more likely to be paying attention to think places where it's just their friends. And that's where Facebook and MySpace play a critical role in that. You had said some of these deal with policy issues. Can we talk about a couple? Sure. What about issues along privacy, especially okay. with the putting out of information on social sites and maybe a young person not thinking through what happens once they put information out there? Well, kids actually care deeply about privacy. There's a big myth out there that kids don't care about privacy. They care deeply. What they care about is the ability to control how information flows. And that's what actually they mean by privacy. They want to know where it's flowing and what are the social costs of it. Most adults are concerned, or you know, the narrative, and especially in policy levels, is of personally identifiable information. Teenagers don't care about that. You can identify them all you want. That's not the problem. What they care about is personally embarrassing information. What will get out there that will be used in a way that will actually embarrass them to their friends, to you know, the broader peers, and you know, to college admissions officers. That's what they're paying attention to. They go out of their way to try to understand the systems and try to, to manipulate it. Uh, Pew uh, Internet and American Life Project has new data that shows that actually young people are much more likely to modify all of the privacy settings than adults. And that's, that's really counterintuitive to people, but teenagers do care about that. They care about being embarrassed. That doesn't mean that they understand when systems change. And one of the challenges right now is that a lot of the systems keep changing their policies, and teenagers are like, what's going on? Now, all this said, teenagers also care about publicity. If they want Justin Bieber to respond to them, they're going to speak out in public in the hopes that he'll see them. 
right? And that kind of publicity is separate from being from the notions of privacy. So a lot of it is choosing what you say in public, what you say in private, and knowing the situation well and knowing how to handle it. And teenagers, like many adults, want to get attention. Uh, so they have a whole variety of different reasons as to why they may be get, trying to get attention or who they're trying to get attention from. But that's always part of the complexity of this. And so privacy and publicity are not two separate things, but they're very intertwined. And teenagers are really at the forefront of working this out. And they're doing a much better job of dealing with it than adults. Uh, one other issue then, adults always concerned about, especially online safety. Of course. Uh, do teenagers have those same concerns? And how do they react to this topic different than, say, adults? Well, or maybe even teen the same? Teenagers have heard the news media stories about the internet being dangerous and predators being everywhere. They've heard it. What you will find is that they, they, they hear these news stories, they refer to Dateline, they refer to all of these massive stories, but they also know nobody that, you know, in their own worlds that's a predator. They've never experienced this, they don't know anybody affected by it. So they're running into a conflict about this. And they're, you know, they're kind of sitting here going, wait a minute, what is the actual message? They're also making a cost-benefit analysis, right? They sit there and be like, well, I actually want to be cool at school, therefore participation is really essential. And I most, when somebody is sketchy, and if they're sketchy, I'll walk away. And so that they're, they're trying to figure out what the right set of actions are given the set of fears. The problem is, is that the fears that have been proliferated by adults are actually an inaccurate image of what's going on. Um, it's actually young adults who might be more manipulative of young people than, than sketchy, random old strangers. You know, the bigger issue that teenagers are really faced with and they're really struggling with is all of the challenges around bullying and, and harassment. Most adults narrate this as the internet being radically different and cyberbullying being separate. That's not actually true. And teenagers will consistently report that they're much more concerned about being bullied in school than, than online. But the thing is, is that when you actually get them to work out what that means, you realize that the same things that allow them to communicate from school to the internet to the telephone are the same things that allow the bullying to continue. And they're frustrated with people that they know um, and the bullying that goes on. And we're seeing this at, at, you know, at a greater level when we start thinking about sexting. Um, and thinking about the fact that you know, a teenager thinks that they're going to be cute and they take a sexy picture of themselves in an attempt to flirt with somebody. It's usually a teenage girl flirting with a boy. The boy sends it around to all the school. Right? And this becomes an issue also of bullying, and actually that's how teenagers narrate it. But nobody realizes at that age that this is child pornography and that the risks are actually much greater than being embarrassed in school. And so there's a whole set of complex pictures around bullying that we really need to work out. The fact is, is as adults, we don't actually know what the right solution is to bullying. We never have. And so we've constantly said, you know, fight back or, you know, you know suck it up, kid. And, and, and those don't work now either. The challenge as adults is that we haven't seen the bullying every day that happens to kids. Most kids don't come home with a black eye. And so when things went bad at school, we didn't hear about it. Now we have access to it. And the visibility that the internet provides is why we're changing our attitudes towards it. So we're like, wow, cyberbullying is really bad. It's the fact that we're actually seeing bullying for the first time. And that's actually, the internet radically changes visibility of a lot of social behaviors. And we have to t take into account what that change in visibility means and how then to act as adults. One more question. Um, is there a government role then for all that you've said about uh, the concerns that how young people use social media? Is there a role for the government in response to that? Of course. The government plays a critical role in all of this. The challenge is to actually understand what the ac actual picture is. The most dangerous thing that the government can do is, is actually make a set of policies based on myths or based on fears. For example, we had a whole set of modes where we we're like, oh, sexual solicitation is a terrible thing, we need to stop it. But once we started looking at the data and we realized that kids were engaging in, in consensual or what they perceived to be consensual acts with, uh, with uh, young adults, we realized that trying to block the communication was not actually going to be solving it. So government needs to be working to try to find the right solutions, but it needs to start with a data-driven perspective. Um, and that means that we also need to think about things that are not just technology first. For example, government has a role to play in, in thinking about bullying, but it's not about thinking of cyberbullying. It's thinking about bullying across all media. And a lot of it comes down to what are the government's uh, roles in related to education. You know, government doesn't just control sort of laws and saying, ah, this is, you know, this is how we will enact policy. Education policy is a critical one. Another thing that needs to be thought in education policy is information literacy. That's critical to all of this, and that's probably the best solution for a lot of the things where teenagers are dealing with it with one another. You know, when it comes to privacy, the government, of course, they have a role in this, and they have a role to make certain that, that people are, people's desires, goals, and expectations are actually met, that they're not opted into things that they didn't actually consent to, and that they encourage and force companies to act in a way where they're making certain that they get informed consent at every step. 
So the government is an important actor in this, but it's not the only actor, and it needs to be in dialogue with what's actually going on rather than just trying to stop the fears. Dana Boyd of Microsoft Research, thank you. Thank you. That's it for this edition of The Communicators. You can see these and other interviews from the Gov 2.0 Expo when you visit our webpage at cspan.org.